the story of the liberation of the Israelitish nation from slavery in Egypt has caught the attention of many generations for many years. The slavery was hard, was very hard, and the people were under under the strong hand of a pharaoh and life was very difficult for those people really life was difficult today brethren we live in a similar situation life is very difficult for a lot of people we all in different situations we all have different uh, instances in our lives of different things but we all go through difficulties in our lives in one way or another life is difficult and particularly maybe even so more in some countries I received in Portuguese so I've got this note here in Portuguese and I'm going to read it to you now what I'm reading but I'm going to read it in English so, <laughs> so I'm translating as, as I'm reading it So, <coughs> and it says we are Christian pastors through the grace of God in this country I deliberately took the name of the country out uh, if you want to know later on please uh, ask me and then we ask to fellow servants of God around the world that our voice may be heard before the Father uh, in this situation what is happening in this nation is without historical precedent in this modern era only Adolf Hitler demonstrated such degree of cruelty and that we are confronting a wave of violent acts which have attempted to destroy the life of the citizens of this nation leaving a trail of death destruction hatred and violence now, then the note continues with many other facts. But I think that shows that in some countries today, things are really far worse than we are in this country. The world is horrible, brethren. And you and I, we all, maybe in some countries even more, other countries even more, we are in a slavery situation. We are slaves to this situation that we're encountering ourselves just like the Israelites were freed or liberated from slavery to go to the promised land and just like God acted and spoke through the angel of the Lord through the Lord through the word that was with God that was God and became flesh and lived amongst us John 1 verse 1 and verse 14 that spiritual rock which guided them was Christ 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4 likewise today brethren that spiritual rock Christ is going to take us out of the slavery of this world and is taking us out of the slavery of sin that we encountering ourselves in because the the slavery of this world is under the hands of an invisible pharaoh and this invisible pharaoh is none under none under than satan the devil and the pharaoh which controls this world is is going to have to be forced to let my people go Satan will be forced to let my people go just like Pharaoh had to be forced to let my people go and in this case at this time of the end will not be only Israel but it will be the whole world the whole world will be liberated from the slavery that is under now the slavery of Satan brethren as the children of Israel 
foreshadow the church which is called out of the world likewise the church foreshadows the world that will be liberated in other words the people of the world the nations that will be liberated from this evil world and they'll be liberated to the real promised land will be the kingdom of God reigning on earth for a thousand years initially and then beyond that the eternal life and so we will be we will be liberated to live a different way a different way of life and so it is good brethren to review annually these events and to bring them to the top of our mind these events that happened and look at some analogies that apply to us today the events of the Passover that happened on the 14th day of Nisan and so to do that let's start by looking at Exodus chapter 1 so if you turn with me to Exodus and we'll start with Exodus chapter 1 And we're going to start by reading uh, in verse 6. And it says, Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly. In other words, they multiplied. They had a lot of children. And it says, and they grew exceedingly mighty. And the land was filled with them. They really multiplied. They had a lot of children. And that nation became quite strong verse 8 and now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph and he said to his people look the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than what we are these Israelites these people are more and mighty than we are so let's deal with them shrewdly and make them slaves and work hard so that we keep them in control we keep them in check and that's what happens today in society you know governments are controlling people and the more you have these ideas of these different isms which is, means government will, will say we'll control you more and more and more and that's the same sort of way of going so there was a, a, an attitude as we can see there in ver towards verse 10 let's deal shrewdly lest they multiply that uh, otherwise they will join our enemies fight against us and so go up out of the land in other words they will say hey we need to control them we need to suppress them we need to smother and strangle them so that we are in charge and control and brethren the same is today the same is today and therefore they said taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens and so we chose that the they, they, they built for Pharaoh uh, different supply cities like Pithom and Ramses and, but the more they got afflicted the more they dealt multiplied the bigger the trial the bigger the affliction the more children they had and the bigger they became and we can see all the way through the end of the chapter uh, that then uh, the, the midwives were asked well um, uh, if it's a boy uh, kill the boy but then they went killing and it says why come well because the, the Israelite women are very strong they come the babies come out before we get there type of thing and so they were blessed and they had families the children and then we get down on to Exodus chapter 2 and we have the story of Moses early life uh, as he becomes a, a general in the in the Egyptian army uh, becomes very very uh, very powerful there so you, you can read that story but then uh, he kills an Egyptian and then is found out and he has to flee and then he flees to Mir uh, Midian and he marries the uh, Midianite uh, woman and look at verse 23 through 25 at the end of chapter 2 it says now it happened in the process of time then that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage and they cried out and their cry came up to God because of the bondage and so God heard their groaning 
And God remembered his covenant with Abram, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God never forgets. And God had made a promise, and he would fulfill it. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. So we, we have here a situation in which the children of Israel were growing, and but they were under a very deep affliction. Meantime, now Moses had been in the desert area for 40 years. Previously, maybe his first 40 years of his life, he had grown to become a very strong and powerful ruler in Egypt. And probably very arrogant. But then, God brought him from a general to a shepherd. To a simple, humble shepherd for 40 years. And throughout those 40 years, he learned humility. Because we read elsewhere, this says, there was no other man as humble as Moses. So, now that God had worked these little things out of Moses to become more malleable and teachable, then the time comes after these 40 years. And 40 is usually a number, uh, implies try and tested. Think about that, 40, that's kind of that. So, in, in, in chapter 3, now Moses was standing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert. And he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him. The angel of the Lord appeared to him. In a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. And as he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire... But the bush was not consumed. I imagine it's burning with fire, but it's not getting burned. So he was very curious. Oh, let me see what this is. And so from yeah, from this moment till the end of the book of Exodus, we're looking at about a period of about two years. This whole section of the book of Exodus from yeah till the end. And so he went there and looked. There's this. It says, the angel of the Lord. Now, who was this angel of the Lord? Look in verse 6. We'll we jump a little ahead and we'll go back to verse 2. Uh, verse 6. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father. This angel of the Lord identified himself as, I am the God of your father. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God so who appeared to him the angel of the Lord who did the angel of the Lord identify himself as I am the God of your father so yeah we have that he saw the being of the God family as we call it today or in other words of the kingdom of God that spoke for the father the word the one that spoke the one who became flesh, whom we call Jesus Christ. And he was God, in the form of God, as we read in Philippians chapter 2 verse 6. So let's go back with Exodus chapter 3 verse 2. It says, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire. In a flame of fire. That's interesting. Because when... They heard the law. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 24. So keep a finger there on Exodus because we're going to come back to it. But look at Deuteronomy 5, verse 24. Deuteronomy 5, verse 24. And it says, And you said, Surely the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his greatness, and we heard his voice from the midst of the fire. So yeah, we have God speaks from the midst of the fire, just like he spoke to Moses from the midst of the fire. 
and it's also very interesting because then we read in Hebrews 12 verse 29 that says God is a consuming fire so what does this fire symbolize well maybe one symbolism I can give you two uh, maybe one symbolism is that the bush was symbolic of Israel because Israel was not a full grown tree was still a bush um, it was still not powerful as a nation and he appeared as a flame of fire within the bush it was within the children of Israel but it was not consumed so typically a fire is like a fiery trial the children of Israel were going through a fiery trial but they were not consumed in fact they were multiplying getting bigger so it's an interesting possibility of a symbolism there there's also another symbolism that fire is a cleansing has a cleansing effect in other words to separate the righteous from the wicked and after all people have learned the truth of God and to go God's ways God will separate the righteous from the unrighteous through the lake of fire a cleansing effect so let's go back to Exodus chapter 3 we finish reading uh, verse 2 and and then we'll jump to verse 4 so when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look so when he saw that that um, that Moses uh, was curious and came and said well let me go and look at this God called to him from the midst of the bush and said Moses Moses and he said here I am then he said do not draw near this place take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground God's presence in that ground at that moment made it holy and therefore God's presence is what makes one holy and therefore he had to show respect to that and look at it in verse 6 through verse 11 and it says moreover he said I am the God of your father the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob I read that already and then verse 7 and the Lord said I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters for I know their sorrows eight so I have come down to deliver them out of the land of Egyptians I beg your pardon out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up fr from that land to a good and large land to a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites and Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hevites and the Jebusites here it was to the promised land now therefore behold said God the cry of the children of Israel has come to me and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them so they, they, the, the Israelites were going through this fiery trial come now verse 10 therefore and I will send you you Moses to Pharaoh that you may bring my people the children of Israel out of Egypt 40 years ago or previously Moses would have said here I am I'm ready now 40 years later after he had been humbled Moses said to God who am I that I should go to Pharaoh there is a man that had been humbled and it's, it's quite something that when we get to a point when we realize we are nobody who am I and if I'm going to do this work it's only by the grace of God and I said who am I that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt so he has the circumstances in his life coming from general to shepherd that brought him to be one of the humblest men if not the humblest man or men uh, on earth uh, on, look at Numbers 12 verse 3 you're not going to turn it there but maybe you want to make a note Numbers 12 3 that says he was the most humble man on earth let's continue then reading uh, verse 12 so Moses said who am I now God encourages him 
God gives him the greatest encouragement you and I could have which says, God says I will certainly be with you I will be with you basically says fear not I'm with you that is a great encouragement brethren and this shall be a sign that I've sent you that when you have brought the people out of Egypt you will come to this very mountain to serve me and they did and that was the sign indeed that God said it's me speaking and from there that will give him Moses encouragement for the other 40 years ahead so we can see yeah uh, what God says he says then Moses said to God verse 13 indeed when I came to the children of Israel and say to them uh, the God of your fathers has sent me to you and they say to me what is his name what shall I say <coughs> what shall I say and then God said to Moses say I am who I am that's a powerful statement I am and I'll always be I am at all times I have control I'll make things happen whichever way I say I am I have power I have control I am I cause to be whatever I say it's gonna be I am what I am whatever will happen it will happen what I say that it's going to happen that's who it is I am who I am in the New Te Testament we read of a number of places that Christ uses these words I am I am the way I am the truth I am the life I am the light of the world John 14 6 John 8 12 John 9 5 and many others there's various I am's in the Gospel of John that sometimes the translators don't even highlight it but Christ said I am many times and so yeah we hear in Exodus the name I am I am who I am but we see that name I am magnified or amplified in the New Testament by saying I am the way I am the truth I am the life I am the light so it magnifies this term greatly in fact you know that when Christ said that there were many times that he got so offended they want to stone him because they says you make yourself to be like God and therefore that's blasphemy so you can see who this was the being of the God family the word the agent for the father that was speaking to Moses who became flesh and who spoke to the Israelites and is our deliverer let's continue then uh, in verse uh, 15 it says moreover God said to Moses thus you shall say to the children of Israel the Lord God of your fathers the God of Abraham the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you this is my name forever now this is very interesting for one is not just the God of Abraham because when it says the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob narrows down to a specific genealogy because Abraham had many other children that identify themselves as the children of Abraham but they're not the children of Jacob 
And Jacob got his name changed to Israel. And therefore they were the children of Israel. And it also says this is my name forever. That means in the world tomorrow you'll also be called by that name. Let's look just at two scriptures which shows that. So keep your fingers there on Exodus 3. But let's look at two other scriptures, uh, prophecies. One is in Isaiah chapter 2 verse 3. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 3. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 3. It says, Many people shall come. And this is talking, it's, it's a millennial scripture. You read about uh, chapter 2 of Isaiah is about the millennium. But here looking in, in verse 3. It says, Many people shall come and say, Come. And let us go to the mountain. Symbolic of what? Government. Nation. To the mountain of the Lord. YHWH, the eternal. To the house of the God of Jacob. He personally will teach us his ways. Who is going to be there? Christ. At the second coming, it's Christ, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that comes down to earth and reign from Jerusalem. He, the God of Jacob, will teach us His ways. And we shall walk in His paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law. So, Yah uses the word, the God of Jacob, in a world tomorrow. You see, it's the name forever. Look, let's look at another example. That's in Micah. In Micah. Micah. So, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Micah. Micah chapter 4, verse 2. Again, this is a, a millennial prophecy. Micah chapter 4 verse 2 and look at that many nations shall come and say come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord the house of the God of Jacob you'll teach us his ways you see so it is re-emphasized and he we shall walk in his paths and for out of Zion the Lord shall go forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem so we can see this is a name forever. So let's go back to um, Exodus. Exodus. We're look, reading about, about um, in chapter 3. And it says in verse 15. It says, uh, Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God, the Yahweh God, Elohim. In other words, the eternal Elohim. Elohim is a uniplural word which implies more than one. And then he says, of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Christ refers to this in Matthew 22, verse 32. Let's look at that in Matthew 22, verse 32. Matthew 22 verse 32 Christ said uh, quoting Yah Christ's word says I am the God of Abraham the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob God is not the God of the dead but of the living oh does it mean therefore that Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are living now no but they will be resurrected and they will be living they will be resurrected. Because you read in Hebrews chapter 11. It says these promises are kept. And they do not receive the promises waiting for you. So they will receive. But they will be alive. Their life potential is not extinguished. Yes their body is dead. But the spirit of man in man. God has kept it. And will put that spirit of man in man into a new body. I'm not talking about a soul. I'm talking about the spirit of man in man. Which in a sense is the recording. Is the, the 
all the things, the characteristics of that person that is saved and stored by God and then is put into a new body it's like an mp3 file or a cd or whatever it is it's put onto a new brand new uh, recorder player and then it plays music but that saved cd dvd mp3 file whatever it is is not alive it's purely a recording so the recording of that being of those beings is stored to be put back into a brand new body at the time of the resurrection and so God has promises made to the children of Israel and there it is the very promises it says they will be alive he's not the God of the dead he's the God of the life and let's back to Exodus chapter 3 verse 16 go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them the Lord God of our fathers the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob has appeared to me saying I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you see and verse 17 I have said God has said I will bring them out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. God has said, like I said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. When God says he's faithful and what he says will happen. There's no questions about it. God has said, when God speaks, it's a promise. God is faithful. Tell the children of Israel. That's what God is telling out to Moses to tell the people of Israel. He says, tell the children of Israel, I have not forgotten the covenant with your fathers. Help is on the way. And you know what? What is the meaning for today? God has not forgotten that he will re release the whole world from the slavery of Satan. Help is on the way. It's not any, re any religious organization. It's not any political party. It's not any leader of any nation that is going to save the world. Oh yes, many will come out and say, vote for me. I'll save all this. Hogwash. None will do it. The only savior of the world is Jesus Christ the governor the king of kings that will bring ultimate savior salvation to the world not only to us individually but to the world to our country to our nations so he's saying God has said I'm coming and Christ has said I will return Come, Lord Jesus, let it be soon. Because the suffering is getting worse and worse by the day. And then we can read from verse 17 through 20, 27, uh, I beg your pardon, um, from verse 18 onwards, we can see how, how, um, how this uh, developed. And then uh, there's various signs that are described, and then it goes into, uh, into the different plagues. And then there is a series of plagues that happen. Nine plagues. In the latest Beyond Today magazine. There's this uh, cover article. The Exodus Plagues. Judgment on Egypt's gods. Very interesting. Because they had many gods. And different plagues. When you read it. They actually attacked those what those gods were like for instance one was the god of the river Nile bang it became blood other were the gods of frogs or whatever it is bang they became a curse and so and they couldn't do a thing with that so it was an attack on all those gods uh, so it's very very interesting it goes through that so uh, make sure you, you take a time to read it but you know what are our gods today 
Oh, we're not like the people of in those days. Don't we? What is our God's today? Whatever God, false God you have or I have or we have will be destroyed. The gods could be, for instance, a political party. People say, well, this political party is going to solve all the problems. No. The gods could be our economic system. Oh, our economy is strong. We're going to resolve all the problems. No. The god could be a new type of ism that is going to bring and solve all the problems. No. All those are false gods and all those will be utterly destroyed. The god could be our education system. No. The god could be our culture. I go into some countries and says, well, it's my culture. Well, that culture will be destroyed. Our culture. We've got our own culture. There are things in our culture that will be destroyed. I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying we have to change. We have to change. Yes, we are blessed with a certain amount of security and blessings. But even that, one day will be destroyed. So whatever it is that we have trusted on is gradually showing its weaknesses today. And you can see. And nations and governments and organizations are being shown that inside them, amongst those leaders, there's corruption. Whatever country. I'm not talking about against America. You can see it in every other country. Every country. There is corruption. There is incompetence in the leadership. And so all those gods, whatever gods it is, were destroyed in Egypt. All the gods we have in the modern age will be destroyed as well. And then there will be the greatest plague after the nine was the tenth wherein the Israelites were delivered from slavery and that was when Pharaoh was destroyed and that's when Satan the devil would be put down look at Exodus chapter 10 Exodus chapter 10 so we're jumping a little bit ahead now in the story after the plagues so we're going to go into the the tenth plague but just before it in Exodus chapter 10 verse 27 through 29 it says the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart you know was to give a an analogy symbolism of Satan and said and he would not let him go and in verse 28 then Pharaoh said to them get away from me you know, it was said to Moses and, and the leaders take heed to yourself and see my face no more he said get out I don't want to see your face anymore for in the day that I see my face you Moses are going to die and so Moses verse 29 said to Pharaoh you've spoken well I will never see your face again. Interesting, isn't it? Moses said, you're right. I'll never see your face again. Why? Why did Moses say that? Because, look at now chapter 11, verse 1. And you could put that between brackets. Because the Lord had said to Moses, as probably it should be, right? That's why Moses said that, because God had told Moses, I'll bring one more plague to Pharaoh and, and on Egypt. And afterwards I'll let you go free. 
And then look at verse 3. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And then verse 4 and said, And thus God, um, Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I'll go out in the midst of Egypt, and all the, the firstborn in the land of Egypt will die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits at the throne, to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the animal, and the firstborn even of the animals. And there'll be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not like before, nor shall be it again. But against none of the children of Israel shall even a dog move its tongue. In other words, it'll be so quiet that a dog won't even bark. Because it'll be so peaceful. But not in the areas of Egypt, because with the dying, etc., and people screaming and shouting, the dogs will be going mad. So he says, but not in the, in the area of the Israelites. That you may know that the Lord does make a difference between Egyptians and Israel. And all these your servants shall come to me and bow down to me saying get out. And all the people will follow you. After that I will go out. And that in a sense could be called close of brackets. Because then it says then he Moses went out from Pharaoh in great anger. You see, so Moses said, you've spoken well. And he knew that. He said, I'll never see you again because God had told him these things. And therefore then, at the end of verse 8 says, Moses went out from Pharaoh in great anger. Oh well, Moses did have an anger issue, didn't he? Well, God addressed that in due time. But he did leave Pharaoh. So we, we see... Uh, 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 situation of of, um, of what happened here at, at the beginning of the the um, of the tenth plague, and then um, and then we get to chapter twelve, and then we get to chapter twelve. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. In verse two, it says this month shall be the beginning of your months it shall be the first month of the year to you as we do a bit of research we find out that the Egyptians had various calendars but one of them was a religious calendar which was uh, managed by the Egyptian priests and it was a calendar that would start the religious year and would start the religious year at the first rising of Sirius a star that symbolized the beginning of the summer solstice and that meant that the river Nile was then going to flood and the flooding of the Nile which would happen toward at the beginning of summer at the, at the summer solstice and it was very regular it then became that time the beginning of the year for the Egyptians and then God said no not that month the beginning of summer but the beginning of spring it will be the, month, the first month to you so you can see that um, God gave them instructions or to work out a calendar according to God's instructions starting in spring and just as it is today with the Hebrew calendar so continue now in uh, verse uh, 3 it says speak to all the children of Israel saying on the 10th Month, or tenth day of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father a lamb for a household and if the household is too small for the lamb let him and his neighbor uh, take it according to the number of persons according to each man's need you, that you shall count uh, shall make your count for the lamb and your lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year so it's a little uh, lamb uh, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats so it could be a goat as well and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month so you take it out on the 10th and you keep it until the 14th day begins in other words after sunset when the day begins at the beginning in other words of the sun, until uh, then um, then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight so as soon as the 14th comes at twilight that's when sun sets and there's still a little bit of light before it gets dark and you'll kill it so uh, we'll continue reading then in verse 7 then you shall take some of the blood 
and put it on the two door posts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat. So first they got to kill it. Now this is after the beginning of the day. Then they got to take the blood and put it on the door posts and on the lintel of the houses where they are. And then shall they eat the flesh that night roasted in fire. Roasted. It's not boiled. It's not fried. It's barbecued. It's roasted. Right? Roasted in fire with unleavened bread. Now it wasn't yet the days of unleavened bread, but they had to eat the Passover with unleavened bread because it points to the Passover, real Passover lamb, which is Christ, and unleavened represents him without sin. So they, with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled, yeah, not boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire. Its heads and its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain till morning. And what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. So, and, and then it says, verse 11, And thus shall you eat it, with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff on your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. They were dressed, ready to leave Egypt. They dressed. But now understand. Now understand. Look at the ad, verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. And I'll strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. I'll execute judgment. I am the Lord. So, think about it. It's sunset. They kill the lamb. Then they got to put the blood on the doors. Then they got to roast it. They got to eat it. Then at that night, or what time at night would that be that says that I'll pass through the land? Well, you just have to go back to the previous chapter, chapter 11, verse 4. It says, chapter 11, verse 4 says, Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt. So what time would it be? Midnight. So it's the night of the 14th. So we know how the day counts. The night of the 14th. And then the day portion of the 14th. So at the beginning of the night of the 14th, the at sunset, the lamb is killed. They put the blood on the doorposts. Then they eat it. At midnight, the Lord passes over. It's the Lord's Passover. Then, the Egyptians die because they didn't put blood on their houses, the firstborn. And then they got the rest of the day portion of the 14th. You see? Look at verse 13 and 14. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are and when I see the blood I will pass over pass over in other words let you go on living in other words it's our forgiveness that he passes over our sins and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike in the land of Egypt so this day shall be to you a memorial and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. That means the 14th, this day, shall be a feast. The feast of the Passover. You shall keep it as a feast by an ordin everlasting ordinance. Look at verse 21. So we jump a little bit now. Exodus 12, verse 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Pick up a lamb and do according like I just told you. And he says, And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood. So now is Moses telling them to do what Moses had been told them he needed to tell them. You see, so the, Mo, God told Moses, and now Moses is telling them, Now this is what you got to do. Go out and do it. He says, and look at it, verse 22. You shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two door posts with the blood that is in the basin. And now look at what he says next. 
and none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. None of you will leave the house until morning. So what do we have? At sunset of the 14th, they kill the lamb. They put the blood on the doors. They roast it. At midnight, the angel passes over the house. But in the meantime, the Egyptians, there's this cry out. They are not to leave their houses till morning. And look at verse 28. Then the children of Israel, still Exodus 12, verse 28. Then the children of Israel went away and did so, just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. Did they disobey this? No. After they seeing all nine plagues and after hearing all the children dying in the neighborhood, the Egyptian neighborhood, I will not disobey. I'll stay right here until morning. It's actually one of the exceptions where the Israelites obey God. So they did not leave. And therefore, during the day portion that followed, that's in verse 33, starting in verse 33, sorry, and the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we're all going to be dead. So the people took their dough, before it was leavened, so they took the bread and the dough very quickly in a rush, having kneaded their bowls, bound up in their clothes and in their shoulders. Now the children had done according to the word of the Moses. Yeah, they obeyed everything. And they had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, that he granted them what they requested. Thus, they plundered the Egyptians. And the children of Israel then left, surjoined from Ramses to Sirkoth, about six hundred thousand men on foot besides children. Now brethren the probability if there were six hundred thousand men is that there would be at least six hundred thousand women. Now that means 1.2 million adults besides children. Now children those for instance less than 20 probably let's say they were multiplying a lot but let's say at least two children that will be another 1.2 million. 1.2 million husband and wife, and another two children per family, another 1.2 million. So we're talking about 2.4 million people. Plus, it says, verse 38, a mixed multitude went out with them. That means some of the Egyptians said, hey, I repent, I'm coming with you. So I don't know how many, but it says a mixed multitude came. So at least, Two and a half million, maybe three million people. Now, you try and go on a camp out with 50 people and organize them to leave a place. And I think it takes a little bit of time to organize 50 people to leave and all to leave at the same time. What if you go in a bus, like in a tour bus, and then he says, okay, we have a 10 minute break, you can go to the toilet, get back in 10 minutes, we'll all leave in 10 minutes. Well, we'll never leave in 10 minutes because get everybody together takes time. Now, getting 3 million people together takes time. And therefore, they use that day portion of the 14th to get the people organized. And as you read, they went organized, each one by their tribes and things like that. They were well organized. They went out disciplined. Everything, God does everything decently and in order. They left well organized. And so <clears throat> we see that they left at the end of that 14th day. So that means by the time they actually left Egypt was in the night. But the following night, the 15th. The time they actually left was the night, but the 15th. So let's go back to Exodus chapter 12 verse 15 because from verse 15 now is God's explanation 
about what are you to do on the days after the Passover. And it was from the 15th till the next seven days. It says, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Why? Because they're leaving now in a rush and they don't have leaven. So it's symbolic there. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation, and on the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation. No manner of work shall be done on them, but that which everyone must eat, that only may be prepared by you. So Yah is an instruction, an interesting instruction, that you're not to work, but you can cook. So they left Egypt. You see there in verse 17. And so you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this same day, which was Dios, the 15th, I have brought you out of armies of the land of Egypt. You see, on the 14th, they couldn't get out because there was the, the killing of the lamb, and they were not allowed to leave the houses until morning. Then they told, get out. Now they've got three million people to organize, and that takes some time. So by the tem time they left was the next night. Was the next night, the beginning of the 15th. You can read that in Deuteronomy 16, verse 1. It says, they left by night. They left by night. So it was the night of the 15th. And that's what we call the night to be much observed. Look at verse 17. Um, on the same day and look at that at verse 40 Exodus 12 verse 40 now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years this in the Septuagint it says and the sojourning of the children of Israel while they sojourned in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan was 430 years so the children of Israel from the time of the promises all the way, the promise to Abram to when they left was 430 years. And that ties in with Galatians 3.17. Galatians 3.17 says there was 430 years from when the promise was given to when the law was given. 430 years. So there it says, uh, verse 41. And it will come to pass at the end of the 430 years, on that very same day. Well, it means God is a calendar. 430 years later, on the same day. It wasn't just by luck. God is a calendar on the same day. It came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out in the land of Egypt. So, brethren, God's plan of salvation is carefully timed. Think about it. God's plan of salvation is carefully timed. God does everything on time. At the exact time. You and I are spiritual pilgrims. These people were pilgrims. And at a certain time, on the right day that God wanted it to be, they stopped their pilgrimage. You and I as spiritual pilgrims are spiritual pilgrims on this earth till the exact day that only the Father knows. No man knows the day. Christ said, no man knows the day or the hour but my Father. But God knows that day. God knows that day. And continue then on verse 42. This is a night to be much solemnly or much observed, as it says in King James Version. Uh, uh, observance to the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. You see, so they didn't bring them out of the Egypt on the 14th, because the 14th, they had to kill the lamb, they had to put the, the, the blood on the door, they had to wait till midnight for the death angel to pass over, and they were not to leave the houses till the morning. So the night that they left, it says, yeah, the night to be much observed is for bringing them out of the land of Egypt was the following night, the 15th. This is that night of the Lord, a solemn observance for all the children of Israel throughout their observations. And today, brethren, we still keep that night to be much observed. 
Now, went through this, brethren, because then Christ, in the New Testament, changed the symbols. You know how John the Baptist said, Yah is the Lamb of God, when he saw Christ uh, to be baptized. And look at it, and, well, let's, let's look at that. You see John 1 verse 29. John 1 verse 29. That's very interesting. John 1 verse 29. John 1 verse 29. That's John the Baptist there. Identifying Christ. And then it says in John 1 verse 29 says. The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said. Behold the Lamb of God. <laughs> the Lamb to the Israelites was a Lamb to the Israelites. This Lamb, the Lamb of God, is to take away the sins of of the whole world not just of the Israelites the whole world and then look at verse 30 it says this is whom I said after me comes a man who is preferred before me for he was before me well of course he was born after John the Baptist but he was before me why because he was, co was eternal he lived eternally I did not know him but that he should be revealed to Israel before I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit ascending from heaven like a dove and remained upon him. So, uh, and he says, I baptize with water, but he, that's Christ, baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So, Christ is the one that immerses us, baptized. The word baptized means immerse, puts us into the body of Christ uh, through. By giving us God's Holy Spirit. And then Christ changed the symbols. We can read in John 13. Where for instance there is a foot washing. During the Passover. Uh, there was a, a Passover. He said well I have long desired to keep this Passover with you. Well in fact let's look at that. Which is in Luke chapter 22. Luke ch chapter 22. You see because some people say. Oh well I can keep the Passover every week. Or I can keep the Passover once a month. Or I can pass over once every three months. Well, what did Christ do? Pass, uh, Luke 22, verse 7. When the day, you know, the season, that's probably a better translation, the season of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. The Passover had to be killed when? On the 14th. The unleavened bread started on the 15th. But therefore, is when the Passover must be killed. And look at verse 14. And when the hour had come. So it's not just the day. But the hour. And so Christ kept the Passover. At the right day. At the right hour. You and I know. That Apostle Paul in Corinthians. It says. The night that the Lord was betrayed. You ought to do the same thing. So we are to do exactly at the same time, on the same day, at the same hour that the Lord did it, which is on the 14th. And so uh, Christ changed the symbols. We read in John 13 about the, the foot washing. It says, do as I've done, which symbolizes selfless service. And then uh, on, uh, you can see how he then took the bread and the wine. And he says... This I've desired to do for a long time. He said in verse 15. Then he said to them. With fervent desire. I have desired to eat this Passover with, with you before I suffer. I have desired to do this. Amazing. Knowing what he knew that he had to go through. He desired to go through that. And then in verse, continue verse 16 says, For I say to you, I'll no longer eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So Christ, when he comes back in the kingdom of God to earth, he will then be taking the Passover with us, with these symbols. But not until then. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I'll not drink of the fruit of the vine, until the kingdom of God comes. And he says do it. 
and he says do it he says yeah and then he took the bread so he took the bread which is my body do it in remember so me and he says and after also he took the the cup and he says uh, it's the cup of the new covenant and so we ought to do this in remembrance of Christ and so it is the blood of the new covenant it's a new covenant and then we see that they sang a hymn we can read that in Matthew 26 in a parallel story and it's important to understand it's a new covenant it's a new agreement it's a new contract that God is making which has got a higher sacrifice which is sacrifice of Christ not a sacrifice of bulls and goats but a sacrifice of Christ and it brings us to a special relationship with the Father reconciled with the Father we then through this are to be led by God's Holy Spirit obviously this covenant is a renewal of our covenant we made at baptism and therefore we then when at baptism we receive the Holy Spirit we now are to be led by Holy Spirit not by man and we must reflect God's Spirit in our lives we must reflect that so we need to prepare for that brethren we prepare for it in two ways number one we prepare physically and before the 15th we need to take leaven out and there are many spiritual lessons out of that uh, we can do that um, we uh, we have a little uh, let me see if I've got it here we have uh, uh, if any of you would like this I can email it to you but it's uh, look for leavening and what is leaven and uh, tell you what what it is leaven so it's it's a leavening agent things that make bread uh, puff up so uh, that I do have and I also um, uh, therefore also also have uh, some uh, scriptures because it's not just a question of you preparing f physically but it's preparing spiritually you all have a handout uh, which is called the uh, Passover season study guide with various scriptures to go through as a preparation for the Passover because even though we prepare physically the important is to prepare spiritually so the physical just reminds us but the important is not to neglect the spiritual we gotta give time to that now when do we do that and when is the Passover and when are God's holy days we have a, a booklet God's holiday plan and in the center fold of that booklet we've got all the dates for this year and future years and some of you probably have a little pocket calendar that we've the church has distributed and I've got a few copies here if any of you don't have which shows the dates so you can identify when those holy days are for you to be prepared but for this year 2019 we have the 14th starts at sunset so the 14th is itself on the on Friday April 19th that's the Passover but because we start at sunset the night before the Passover will be on the 18th we are gathering together on the 18th for Passover again the bread of the Passover is unleavened which represents Jesus Christ without sin the days of unleavened bread are for seven days this year starts from April 20th which is the Sabbath through to the following Friday the 26th uh, which is the 15th day of uh, the first month of God's calendar and the night to be much remembered is that evening uh, on April of at sunset it was before the the Sabbath uh, at sunset at the beginning of the Sabbath which will be Friday night April the 19th so please plan with brethren nearby to actually keep uh, those days we have to prepare spiritually I've given you various scriptures there and and uh, and you have the handout various scriptures that you can use to help you prepare uh, one important point that I just want to leave as a highlight is in 1st Corinthians chapter 5 1st Corinthians chapter 5 from verse 1 through verse 8 but he is talking about you are puffed up and then he says take that person out from among you that has got that sin 
And he says, verse 7, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. You know, purge out those old sins that you may be a new lump, spiritually speaking. Since you are unleavened, physically speaking. For since, because this is during the days of unleavened bread. For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Verse 9, therefore let us keep the feast, the feast of unleavened bread, not with the old leaven, for uh, beg your pardon, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So we got to focus, spiritually speaking, we got to focus in taking out that malice and weakness that we may have and work on being absolutely sincere and truthful. So that pride must be taken out and we must be sincere and truthful. So look at it, the Passover as a, a ceremony to remind us of this. But on the other side, look at it as a victory ceremony. It's a victory. Why? Because through it, we're going to be liberated from the Pharaoh of this world. We will then have a time of reconciliation of mankind. Conflicts, world conflicts will be resolved. And through the sacrifice of Christ, you and I are reconciled with God and can be at peace with God. We are liberated from spiritual slavery. And therefore now, as we are now being liberated from sin, we are now have time we now have time to prepare ourselves to reign with Christ so that we can then rule with Christ when all nations will be liberated from slavery so please let's enter the feast with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth